Welcome to my presentation, the NDE Zone, connected to the light or by the light from the cosmic to the subatomic. Now, there will be no foolish wand waving or silly incantations in this class. Wait a second, I'm wafting into Professor Snape from uh, Hogwarts. And the reason that I'm, I'm, I'm making that joke is because NDEs, mediumship, shared death experiences, deathbed visions, none of that is hocus pocus. This is a real, these are all real phenomenon. And the truth is that since the dawn of recorded history, there have been documented accounts of communication with the other side. The theme of this year's conference is past reflections, current enlightenment and future illumination. And it is in spirit communication can come in many different forms, such as visitations in a dream or when you catch a glimpse of a deceased loved one out of the corner of your eye. It can be through um, a medium like myself. It can be in the form of near-death experiences. It can be in the form of deathbed visions and shared death experiences, just like what William and uh, Michael were just talking about. And the fact of the matter is that spirit communication is part of the human experience. The problem is that traditionally it has been dismissed as fantasy or feared as supernatural and paranormal. Then of course, there's the science crowd, starting with the superstar of the enlightenment, Sir Isaac Newton. And Newton was a really fascinating character. We've all heard the story about him getting the idea of how gravity occurs when he saw an apple fall from a tree. But during the great plague of 1665, Newton was smart enough to be self-quarantined. And during that time, he invented calculus, much to the chagrin of every high school and college student since then. He explored the laws of optics and even developed the laws of gravity. But this led to what has become known as the Newtonian reductive materialism. And reductive materialism, let's take it step by step. Materialism means that the only thing to, that can be proven to exist is matter. Reductive indicates that physical matter is made of molecules, which are in turn composed of atoms. Everything is a mix of matter and energy operating according to physical laws. Reality is what is observable, objective, and reproducible. But the reductive materialists do not believe that the supernatural exists, neither do spirits, the afterlife, or God. And this then creates what I call the Newton paradox. Newton believed in God, but he didn't believe in the existence of a soul or the afterlife. And he spent more time studying the Bible, seeking hidden messages than he did studying science. Now think about that. This is the guy that in, invented physics, basically, developed the laws of gravity, the laws of optics. And he spent more time studying the Bible, looking for encrypted messages. So in a sense, physics was a secondary occupation for Newton. But he said, atheism is so senseless. When I look at the solar system, I see the earth at the right distance from the sun to receive the proper amounts of heat and light. This did not happen by chance. So Newton and reductive materialism split the world, at least in, in our terms, into two camps, faith versus science. People of faith look at, looked at people of science as heretical, blasphemous atheists, and people of science look down their noses at people of faith as clinging to outmoded, pre-enlightenment mythological superstitions. But present enlightenment really took off in 1967 at the University of Virginia with Dr. Ian Stevenson. He founded the Division of Perceptual Studies at UVA. And this was the first time that consciousness was studied pursuant to the scientific method. So Dr. Stevenson started studying phenomena related to consciousness surviving physical death. He's also very, very well known for his studies in reincarnation, which I discuss in another one of my lectures. But for our purposes, 
um, he basically got the ball rolling. And then in the 1970s, Dr. Raymond Moody, who will also be speaking at this conference, coined the term near-death experiences. This was monumental because for thousands of years, people had reported these incidents of people dying and then coming back to life with these incredible tales of going into the light, encountering deceased loved ones, encountering even what we could possibly consider to be God. And it baffled religious and medical professionals. What were these resurrections? Nobody knew what to call it until Dr. Raymond Moody developed the term near-death experiences and began to apply the scientific method of objective observation to them. And then this led to a group of guys, John Audet, Dr. Ken Ring, Dr. Bruce Grayson, Dr. Michael Sabam, into forming the International Association of Near-Death Studies 40 years ago. And because of IANS, and the work of Dr. Moody and the work of Dr. Ian Stevenson, survival of consciousness, near-death experiences, and spirit communication are real and can be explained through science. Future illumination. Understanding these phenomena begins with the common denominator of light. Life as we know it depends on light. Think about it. If it weren't for the light of the sun, Earth would be nothing more than a frozen chunk of ice wandering through space. But because of the warmth in the sun, um, the sun creates an environment that we are able to live in. And plants take the energy of the sun, convert it to nutrients. So everything that we eat is either plants or animals we eat plants, and everything on Earth consumes something that at one point depended on light for its existence. So light is the building block of life. Then every great spiritual teacher, 5,000 years ago, Krishna in India talked about the light. Then Buddha talked about encountering the light. Jesus talked about the light. Muhammad, Yogananda, Paramahansa, St. Francis of Assisi, Lao Tzu, Confucius, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, uh, Native American spirituality, Every great spiritual teacher describes God in terms of light. Now, let's take a practical application of light. How many of you have felt that you caught a glimpse of a spirit in a mirror? You know, maybe you're in, in your bedroom or in the bathroom, and you look in the mirror, and there you catch the glimpse of a spirit. Have you ever tried to look at a comet? directly you, you know we've all seen you know hear about comets and you go outside at night and you want to look at it and you're straining and struggling to look at it and it's very difficult to look at it and see it head on what about have you ever glimpsed a spirit in your peripheral vision and then turned and that spirit vanishes actually i had this experience um, about two weeks ago one of my neighbors unfortunately her her daughter died about a year ago, and she saw me outside, and she came across the street, and she says, Mark, I could swear I saw Megan. I saw her out of the corner of my eye, and I turned, and she, she vanished. She's not there anymore, is she? And I said, yes, she is. Now, why do all these things happen? Why do people catch a glimpse of a spirit in a mirror? Why can't you see a comet clearly when you look at it directly? Why do people catch a glimpse of a spirit in their peripheral vision, then turn and the spirit vanishes? Well, the fact is, it depends and is based on the structure of our eye. The eye contains rods and cones. Rods are at the periphery of the eye and they're very light sensitive. Cones are at the center of the retina and they detect color and detail. So let's look at it a little bit more closely. All right, so let's take cones. Cones are best for daytime vision. Okay, if you're a pilot, you love using your cones, especially, you know, when you're flying because cones not only see light, but they see color and they see intricate details. Yet nighttime vision depends on rods because it's best to view things then out of your peripheral vision. Why? Because the rods in your eye are extremely light sensitive, but they lack 
the ability to perceive color and many intricate details. So that's why people tend to think of ghosts, everything from Casper the Friendly Ghost to uh, people's depictions in art and literature and firsthand accounts of ghosts being black and white or shadowy figures. It's, they aren't. It's our ability to perceive these subtle light emissions that we perceive through the rods in our eyes, give this black and white, um, grayish, transparent um, apparition. And that's also why astronomers have developed the tech, uh, technique known as averted vision. And averted vision is for looking at something like a comet. So when you spot the comet, you, you locate it and then look at it out of your peripheral vision. So you look to one side, so you expose the most sensitive part of your eye to light, which are the rods, so you can better see faint objects. And that's why people catch a glimpse of a spirit in a mirror. That's why they catch a glimpse of a spirit in peripheral vision. And that's why when observing phenomena like a comet, you do it with your peripheral vision. And it's a scientific reason for why these things happen. Now, let's move on to light itself. Light is a very, very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now look at the electromagnetic spectrum. There's radio waves, microwaves, infrared, light, ultraviolet, X-rays, and gamma rays. And as you can see from the diagram, I am, uh, put the little white pyramid, that shows what a small segment on um, the electromagnetic spectrum that light actually occupies. Now here's the thing about light. It's the only form of electromagnetic energy visible to the human eye. We had to develop extremely sophisticated forms of technology to perceive the other forms of electromagnetic energy. The other thing about the EM, the electromagnetic spectrum, is that all the different forms of energy within it move at the same speed, the speed of light, 186,282 miles per second. So in the time it took me just to say that, a spirit, which is pure electromagnetic energy, could have been back and forth to the moon a couple times and maybe spun around the world, popped off in Japan to see what was going on, and then returned here. Light is electromagnetic energy. And we know from the laws of physics that energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. So. Here comes the dawn of the 20th century, and now we're well into the 21st century, and quantum physics. So much for Newtonian reductive materialism. See, quantum physics proved that everything is composed of molecules, which are in turn composed of atoms. Now, Newton knew this, and we can't really fault Newton because, let's face it, he was dealing with 18th century technology. He didn't have the benefit of electron microscope or, or uh, particle colliders. He simply was limited to the technology of the day, and based on the data that he had, he believed that the buck stopped at atoms. But now we know that atoms are made of smaller particles, electrons, protons, and neutrons and that protons and neutrons are composed of even smaller um, particles of electromagnetic energy known as quanta. Um, technically, an electron is a um, quantum particle, so everything on the most basic level is composed of electromagnetic energy, quantum or quantum physics. Not only that, but everything has a vibration. Everything in our universe is constantly in motion, vibrating, even objects like this pen, okay? This pen may appear to be stationary, but on the subatomic level, it is vibrating, but it vibrates at a different rate than I do, than the air that we're breathing, than the radio waves that are transmitting this program, than the light from the sun, that the nuclear reactions in the sun, everything on its most basic level is electromagnetic energy, but everything vibrates at different frequencies. This brings us now to neuroscience. Neuroscience is the study of the human brain. The brain is essentially a carbon-12 and salt resonator floating in water. 
it has an electromagnetic field. Now, the pos official position of neuroscience is that the brain creates consciousness through chemical reactions and electromagnetic electrical impulses, but neuroscientists can't explain how. So what are we? Well, the best way to describe this is think of your body like a car. Now, some people have a really flashy car. It's a really hot car. And people may look at that car and say, you know, I think I'd really like to take a ride in that car. And then other people may not so much. The truth is, we are not our bodies. We are energy, which in the fields of psychology, neuroscience, and philosophy is referred to as consciousness. In the realms of faith, it is called either the soul or the spirit. And consciousness is what makes us unique. It includes our personality, observations, memories, knowledge, and love. Consciousness is pure energy. It pre-exists the body, comes into the body, and then lives on after the physical death. In other words, consciousness is eternal. Consciousness is capable of perception that far exceeds the scope of our five physical senses of sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch. It is capable of perceiving and communicating with other dimensions beyond our material world. Albert Einstein once said, matter is energy, energy is light. We are all light beings. Okay, what do we keep seeing through all of this? The concept of light. Now, in recent years, quantum physicists have chimed in on the consciousness debate. And Professor Hans-Peter Dorr of the Max Planck Institute in Germany said, the brain is like a computer hard drive. When the hard drive dies, we do not lose this information, this consciousness. The body dies, but the spiritual quantum field continues in this way. We are immortal. You got to forgive me. I spent a lot of time in Germany. I also spent a lot of time at Oxford. And Sir Roger Penrose of Oxford said, consciousness derives from quantum vibrations within the brain's neurons. In a spiritual sense, consciousness has been here all along. So wait a second. So we've gone from Newtonian reductive materialism of the 18th century to quantum physics to a divide between faith and science. But now we are having quantum physicists and brain experts um, begin to agree and the, the division between faith and science, between the existence of a soul, between the afterlife is beginning to fade. So let's look at physics. What does physics say about energy? Energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. That's not a theory, that's the laws of physics. What does faith teach us? That the soul, the spirit, the consciousness, not only is it pure energy, but it pre-exists the body, comes into the body, and after the physical death of the body, it moves on. Now, the example of the car. Okay, when your car breaks down, what happens? You get out and you leave the car behind because we are not our bodies. We are not the car. And after years of studying faith, science, quantum physics, theology, and my work as a head injury specialist when I was a, um, a litigator practicing law, I developed the term the electromagnetic soul, the EMS. This is my 21st century term to describe what we really are, that our soul, our spirit is pure consciousness, which is eternal electromagnetic energy. And um, this is one of the, the, the new theories that I'm putting forth in my upcoming book, The Afterlife Frequency, which comes out in October. And my book was peer reviewed by the top near death experience researchers and physicists in the world. And um, I loved it when uh, Dr. Gary Schwartz, and he's a great guy, he, he uh, wrote the foreword for the book. And he said, You know, Mark, uh, he goes, 20 years ago, I came up with the term the electromagnetic dynamical mind brain body system. He goes, You said it better. Can I borrow your term, the EMS? And I said, Absolutely, Dr. Schwartz. So the electromagnetic soul 
bridges the gap between faith and science to prove what we really are, pure consciousness, which is eternal electromagnetic energy. So let's throw a bone to the Newtonian reductive materialists. If that's true, why don't we just use some diagnostic tests like an EEG, an electroencephalogram, or a QEEG, a quantitative electroencephalogram, and just, uh, you know, tune into the electromagnetic soul? Well, that's a good argument, except for the fact that EEG and QEEG are extremely useful for medical diagnosis, but they're neither sensitive enough nor designed to identify the EMS, the electromagnetic soul, much less are they designed to tune into the afterlife frequency. So yeah, they're great tools, but they're not the right technology to identify the soul or tune in to the other side and engage in spirit communication. In fact, uh, Professor Shelley Renee Joy of the California Institute of Integral Studies has stated, it is entirely feasible that there are specific ranges of harmonic frequencies that interact with mind-brain systems through resonance at far higher frequencies than currently supposed. In other words, Yes, the spirit is resonating at a frequency that our technology may not be possibly designed to detect. So what does this mean? I want to look at after-death communication, mediumship, deathbed visions, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, and shared death experiences. That's why I call this talk the NDE zone. Why do I call it that? Well, traditionally, after-death communication, mediumship, deathbed visions, out-of-body experiences, NDEs and SDEs have all been placed into separate categories, and they've been studied as separate phenomenon, but they're not. They are all forms of what I have termed interdimensional communication. And that occurs when the vibration of the electromagnetic soul aligns with the higher vibration of the afterlife frequency. So how does interdimensional communication happen? Well, this brings us to quantum entanglement. So quantum entanglement, scientists have, um, and I'm quoting Edgar Mitchell, who's an astronaut, na na excuse me, Navy pilot, aeronautical engineer, UFOologist. He was also the founder of our sister organization, the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And he explains how quantum entanglement is when subatomic matter is in a process together. Subsequently, the subatomic particles go apart from each other and go across the universe. When they do this, they will remain entangled. This means if you do something to one, the other responds immediately, instantaneously. Scientists, quantum physicists, believe that even if two subatomic particles are a billion miles apart, they are still energetically connected. That is quantum entanglement. This brings me to the concept of frequency beacons. Frequency beacons is, is a term that I developed for my last book, Evidence of Eternity, and I continue with it in the afterlife frequency. And this is also a phenomenon described by people who have had near-death experiences, shared death experiences, deathbed visions, out-of-body experiences, and mediumship and visitations. Think about it. Think of everyone that you know, both in this world and the other side, as being connected to you through a three-dimensional spider web, all right? And how's the spider, we'll take the spider out of it because, you know, you know they're kind of creepy, but, um, but they serve a purpose. But how's the spider know something's in, the, in its web? If something hits the web, there's a vibration that moves along the web, alerting the spider. Well, it's the same thing with with frequency beacons. For those of you who are parents, ask yourselves, how many times have you suddenly got that feeling that, oh my gosh, something's wrong with my child. There's, there's been something. And then you get the phone call that, you know, maybe your child got hurt or was in an accident or, you know, just need your help. Do you think that's a fluke? No, that is a form of quantum entanglement. 
That's how we're all energetically linked through the subatomic electromagnetic energy. And this phenomenon seems to be intensified when we're dealing with spirits. Now, why is that? That's because spirits are the electromagnetic soul. They're pure energy. They're vibrating at a higher frequency, and they are not limited to and, and anchored to the material world through this denser structure known as, as a body. So spirits can emit frequency beacons to us all the time, and they do. For example, ever been driving in your car down the road and all of a sudden you feel compelled to turn on the radio and there's that song. Oh my gosh, there's that song that makes you think of your deceased loved one. Ever suddenly smelled maybe your mother's cologne or your grandfather's pipe smoke and there's no source for that scent? Ever catch a glimpse of a loved one out of your peripheral vision, possibly in a mirror? These are all forms of frequency beacons where spirits are emitting that vibration through that energetic tether, the same way a spider web works. Guess what? It's a two-way street. This is why many times when people are grieving intensely and all of a sudden they feel a loved one come to them because we're emitting frequency to them, frequency beacons, and it draws the spirit to us. So this all comes down to the energetic interconnection. And this is also things that, that everyone that's had a form of interdimensional communication describes. Everyone here who's had an NDE, myself included, understands how we all feel and are interconnected. Mediums understand how we're all interconnected. Certainly shared death experiences are a prime example of interconnectedness. And anyone who's had a loved one come and visit them, either in a dream, uh, in the sleep state, or um, through any of the, the, the various forms of spirit contact from seeing them, smelling a scent, um, actually hearing a voice, these are all forms of frequency beacons. So where does this occur? Well, I'm using this frequency wave as as a depiction of the vibration of our material world dimension. And then there's the afterlife frequency of the other side dimension. You see how it's a much more rapid, much more intense frequency. Interdimensional communication, near-death experiences, shared death experiences, deathbed visions, after-death communication, which includes visitations and mediumship, all occur when these two frequencies overlap and touch. And that is why I call this presentation the NDE zone. Think about it. When you have a near-death experience, um, I was talking to Dr. Kenneth Ring, and he said, it's kind of like um, your soul is, is, is attached to a rubber band, and all of a sudden you physically die and you get pulled right to the other side frequency, and then wham, it pulls you right back, okay? So that's happening in between this shared death experiences, mediumship. This is where the, the um, medium is bringing his or her vibration of the electromagnetic soul up to a higher frequency. The electromagnetic souls of spirits bring theirs down and we get a frequency match. And that's the NDE zone. Now, let's talk about a practical application. Brainwave frequencies. Electrical activity in the brain changes depending on what a person's doing. And in, in um, modern science, this is a relatively new discovery. I mean, new discovery, it's been around for several decades, but science has discovered that we have different frequencies going on inside of our brain. And brainwave frequency of someone who is sleeping is very different from someone who's awake. And as technology advances, this has yielded greater understanding exactly what brain waves represent and what they indicate about a person's health and state of mind. So I developed this chart to help us understand what that means. There are five different types of brain waves: gamma, beta, alpha, theta, and delta. Okay, gamma, that is heightened perception. This is like the Matamodios and the Ken Jennings when they're in full jeopardy mode, okay? This is when you're doing calculus problems, you are, your brain is running at full throttle, and that's why it's got such a rapid frequency. Beta state, 
That's what we're in when we're awake. This is the brainwave frequency that gets you out of bed in the morning, helps you put on your shoes, uh, write checks or pay bills online, drive your car. That's the awake, uh, the awake state. That's what we, you know, how we live our, for the most part, our conscious awake life. Then there's alpha. You see how alpha is a slower frequency, um, a bit more fluid. Well, that's when you're physically and mentally relaxed. And then as you go to a lower frequency, that's theta. And that's reduced consciousness. That's the dream state. That's people that go into deep states of meditation. Then there's the delta state. Now, delta has been crashed on as, oh, well, you know, delta, not much is going on. But delta is very important, too. It's dreamless sleep. There may be a sense of loss of bodily awareness, but this is when your body repairs itself. Okay, so it's shifting energy to other things. The reason that I have the pink arrow between alpha and theta is because it is on the alpha-theta border that psychic and mediumistic activity occurs. And for those of us, including myself, who have been subjected to um, brain studies and, and when we uh, go into the psychic and mediumistic state, they see our brainwave frequency adjust to this. This is also why spirits will come to you in the sleep state. And there's a difference between a dream and a visitation from a spirit. Dreams have that surrealistic nonsense, you know, the, the you know, all of a sudden your toaster turns into a, you know, a clown or whatever. Um, but a visitation from a loved one, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It feels real. When you wake up, you say, oh my God, I really did. I had a conversation with my father. So what scientists do not yet understand is why mediums like myself can go from beta to alpha theta within seconds. Normally it takes hours when you go to sleep, you go for alpha and then eventually you drift into theta for this to happen. So that's still open to further study. But this is a schematic to help you understand the importance of brainwave frequencies. There's also a physical apparatus for our ability to perceive and receive messages from spirits. For those of you who do yoga, you're aware of the chakras. There's seven energy centers within our body, which are represented by different colors. That that, um, and what's fascinating is it was Hindus uh, from India over five thousand years ago that came up with the concept of chakras and identify their locations. Well, the seven chakras coincide with the seven endocrine glands in our body. I'm going to focus on, on the, the two. Look, I'm, I got to make a joke here. The red chakra, the root chakra, which deals with our reproductive um, functions. I was a criminal defense lawyer and a prosecutor for quite some time. And the problem is a lot of people end up in the criminal justice system because perhaps they place too much focus on that chakra. Anyway, I digress. All right, but let's talk about the two psychic chakras, the solar plexus, okay? That's in the the, the, the pit of the stomach, just below the rib cage, um, just below um, the, the xiphoid tip. And that is in, in essentially in your diaphragm and is associated most closely with the pancreas. The other one is the pineal gland. And I wanna take these one at a time. The pineal gland is a gland a little bit bigger than a grain of rice, a little bit smaller maybe than than a, a lima bean. And it's been referred to as a radio station in our heads. Well, why is that? Well, um, in recent years, there's been a British um, German study and then a French Israeli study, and they have located within the pineal gland calcite and magnetite crystals. Okay, so there's crystals, magnetite actually having magnetic properties. The pineal gland re regulates our brain waves and it secretes hormones which affect the RAS, the reticular activating system. And that, so that controls our brain wave frequencies. The pineal gland also controls our circadian rhythms, which includes our body temperature, our sleep cycles, our activity levels, our digestion. Um, basically, 
um, what we do. And you know what? It's also for, for anyone that's ever traveled and gotten jet lag, it's the pineal gland that causes the jet lag. Why? Because it's geared to where we are and it takes time to adjust to a new light cycle and a new um, actual position on planet Earth. And that's why it throws the circadian rhythms off. That's why we get jet lag. But then again, the pineal gland also governs the perception of light. Here we go again. Here's the common denominator, light. Does it just regulate how we perceive light visually or does it regulate how we perceive light in the spiritual sense. Well, what was the first radio? A piece of quartz crystal. You can see that labeled right there with copper wire running low levels of electricity through it. And so basically the pineal gland is a much more sophisticated version of this. We have a radio station in our heads. Next is the solar plexus. The reason it's called solar plexus is because the nerves that radiate from it are like the rays of the sun. So it refers to the resemblance between the radial network of nerves and ganglia and the rays of the sun. And according to Dr. Emerin Mayer of UCLA, there is a link between gut feelings and intuitive knowledge. Think about it. When you get that feeling in your stomach, okay? Uh, my dad was a Navy SEAL. I've been around a lot of military, a lot of first responders my whole life. And every one of them I know says, trust your gut. Guess what? They're talking about their solar plexus. They're talking about that psychic receptor. Okay. Now, if you, if you talk about that in the sense of intuition, you know, women are better at embracing emotions than men are. And women are more willing to accept the importance of intuition, guys will reject it unless you put it in terms of gut instinct. Then it becomes very Denzel, very Harrison Ford, very Chris Pratt. But the thing is, it's very real. And let me tell you why. The solar plexus is a collection of two bundles of nerves or ganglion that intertwine at a central location in the abdomen. The solar plexus is the largest and most complex nerve center outside of the cerebral cortex. And Dr. David Wingate and Dr. Michael Gershorn, um, Gershorns of Columbia Presbyterian uh, Medical Center in New York City, Dr. David Wingate, University of London, have actually referred to the solar plexus as the second brain. And other Like there are nerve centers in dull muscular functions and carry on brain-like functions. And now we know that we have this second brain in our own bodies. Mediumship. Mediums are like telephones through which spirit communication takes place. Interdimensional communication is a form of telepathy. A spirit transmits vibrational frequency to the medium. The vibration is then translated by the brain into recognizable memory, you know, uh, concepts, feelings, and cultural associations of the medium. Think of it like this. In a mediumship reading, you were connecting with the afterlife frequency, okay, the other side. You have the medium, you have the client. And so the afterlife frequency transmits information to the medium, the medium explains it, conveys it to the client, the client provides confirmation. In a, in a um, reading, and we had several of those last night in my workshop, and let me tell you, the attendees were just wonderful at, at uh, putting um, uh, the, the information and receiving the clues and understanding what was being conveyed. And so in a, in a, in a clear reading, this is what's going on. Now, for people who are either uncooperative and, and not necessarily voluntarily, could be somebody who's in a profound state of grief. That's why I always recommend if you're going to do a reading, wait about six months after the death so that your emotions stabilize. Because let's say you're just overcome with grief and negative emotions, or if you're not understanding or you're, you're, um, you say no to everything, you go right to no. I call that the no, no, no syndrome. What that does is it generates an energetic barrier, which can cause complications during the reading. So 
What about people who aren't mediums? Well, the truth is, everyone is capable of experiencing interdimensional communication. Why? Well, we all have the same basic physiology. Everybody's got a pineal gland. Everybody's got a solar plexus. But, you know, people are just good at different things. I mean, I can swim, but let's face it, I'm not going to be winning 10 gold medals in the Olympics. I can bang around on a piano, but don't expect Rachmaninoff to be coming out of my fingers anytime soon. And then I needed to figure a way to explain that. How could I explain that everyone is capable of having a mediumistic experience, even if they weren't mediums? And so I was working on my book, The Afterlife Frequency, and I hit a brick wall. I could not, for the life of me, figure a way to explain this. I had the dreaded writer's block. So I said, all right, that's it. So I got up and I was going to go for a walk on the beach. I live about a block from the ocean. So I'm heading towards the beach and all of a sudden I get this tingly sensation and I do an about face. I go, okay. And I start walking towards a bike path, which is near my house. So I knew something was up. So I figured, all right, let me go for a walk on the bike path. And I'm walking there and all of a sudden I see these two objects shining in the light. And I walk up to them and I look down and it's two coins. And I go to pick them up and I hear my, both my parents have passed. Both my parents were, were very psychically gifted. My mother and father were both mediums. And I went to pick these coins up and I hear my mother's voice. And she says, if they're not heads up, don't pick them up. And I started laughing because that's, uh, my mother's family was of Italian descent and, and, and they have a superstition for anything. If a coin's not head up, it's bad luck. And then I hear my dad's voice it's money, grab it. And I started laughing. So I, I picked these coins up and I'm holding them there in my hand and I'm looking at them. I go, oh, six cents, six cents. It hit me. I go six cents. And, and I felt chills and tingles. And I knew my parents were telling me something. And then in my mind's eye, this, this image of my father standing in the ocean. He was a Navy SEAL. He was a scuba diver and he was a swimming instructor at the Y. And there he was holding this blue canvas raft that he had. And I'm hearing raft, raft. And I'm like, and I knew, okay. And I'm like, okay, okay. He's sending me something. And then it dawned on me. It hit me all at once. Recognize, accept, feel, trust the raft technique. And, and I, I, that was it. And I ran back back to, to, to my house, got back to my office, and the words just flew out of my fingers. I wrote like, it was probably 10 paragraphs about the RAF technique, which teaches people how to recognize the signs from spirits, to accept the experience is real, to feel it without fear and feel it. And, and the feel stage is where everybody goes wrong is where, okay, um, uh, this must be my imagination. It's got to be a grief-induced hallucination. Now it's wishful thinking. See, when you start clouding the feel with hyperanalysis, you start cr uh, what I call cross-examining the experience, then, then you're going to lose, lose the message. So if you can recognize, accept, feel, and then trust the message. And let me tell you something. Messages from spirits. This is a gift from God. And messages from, from spirits, spirits are not controlling. They are not here to compel us to do negative things. Messages from spirits are about love, healing, resolution. They are never about anger, bigotry, hatred, and violence. And that's how you can tell the difference. In this day and age, there's all sorts of things going around about, oh, I'm receiving a message to go do this type of negative behavior, blow this up, invade this, uh, insurrect that. That's not spiritual. That's the ego. Okay, messages from of a spiritual nature are never about that. Now, the RAF technique is not just for experiences um, of, like I just explained, it not just applies to mediumship or visitation. They can also, the RAF technique can also be used to help you interpret and make sense out of near-death experiences, deathbed visions, and shared death experiences. An NDE occurs when a person physically dies and the electromagnetic soul separates from the body but the consciousness remains intact. And then the EMS quantum leaps from one dimension to another. And that dimension is called the other side. 
So past reflections, present enlightenment, and future illumination. Let's go to the past for a minute. Charles Dickens, student of psychic research, author of A Christmas Carol. I know we've all either seen it or suffered through some version of it at Christmas. It may be based on accounts of near-death experiences. Okay, so Ebenezer Scrooge, he's visited by the ghost of Christmas past, who shows him when he used to be a nice guy and how life had promise. Then the ghost of Christmas present, which shows him what a miserable, cantankerous, money-obsessed, ego-driven narcissist he's become. And then he's confronted by the ghost of Christmas yet to come, which shows him um, terrible things, how people can't stand him, and how he's not only going to die lonely, but he will end up being forgotten. It is believed by many that this very well could have been um, accounts that Dickens got from other people in his own research of the life review, which as someone's dying, their life flashes before them, their eyes, and that the ghost of Christmas yet to come could possibly be known as a distressing near-death experience, also known as a hellish NDE. And the world's foremost expert on the hellish NDE, the distressing near-death experience, is I'm proud to call her my friend and colleague, Nancy Evans Bush, also one of the speakers at this conference, and I highly recommend her books. On the flip side of the karma coin, could there be a non-spiritual reductionist materialist explanation for near-death experiences? This brings us to dimethyltryptamine, DMT. When a person is dying, the pineal gland, as it's degrading and decomposing, secretes dimethyltryptamine, which is a natural hallucinogenic. So basically, you start giving yourself an acid trip. Now, the interesting thing about DMT, it can be synthesized. And there's people who take DMT because not only does it give you a floating sensation, but it feels like a spiritual experience. So... The, the biggest weapon in the Newtonian reductionist um, arsenal is that an NDE is just a side effect of a dying brain. But what DMT doesn't induce is the sense of traveling through a tunnel, entering a transcendent realm, veridical perception during the experience. In other words, I was floating above the operating room and there were six people in it and uh, the nurse dropped this and the doctor said that and then my consciousness went down the hall to where my family was crying and, and praying and you hear exactly what they said. An acid trip or a DMT trip doesn't do that. In 1780, Luigi Galvani discovered that the muscles of dead frogs twitched when they were shocked with electricity. Now, this may not seem like a very big deal for us because every junior high school and high school kid that had to dissect a frog's probably done things like this. But think of it, maybe not quite 20 years before this, Benjamin Franklin actually discovered electricity. So this was a new thing. And this led Luigi Galvani to the discovery of bioelectricity, the electricity generated within an organism, especially by a muscle or nerve. In other words, our nervous system uses electricity. But what we've also come to learn is that artificial inducement does not recreate the authentic experience. So sure, you can do a DMT trip, but the artificial inducement does not recreate authentic near-death experience. Although Luigi Galvani's artificial inducement of frog's legs um, reacting when shocked with electricity certainly gave Mary Shelley the idea to write Frankenstein in 1817. So we have the other side dimension, our material world dimension, and what happens when the two frequencies overlap. This brings us to deathbed visions, shared death experiences, which are essentially are multiple simultaneous NDEs. It is a frequency overlap of the electromagnetic soul with the afterlife frequency. Deathbed visions, um, as um, our friend and colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Long, I believe he's also speaking at this conference, 
has uh, examined these in depth, that they've been reported for centuries. And that's where this painting comes from. Um, people have been having deathbed visions. And as Dr. Long, it describes it, those dying may report seeing or hearing dead loved ones, religious, spiritual beings, or beautiful scenery. Steve Jobs, probably one of the most famous, recognizable people in the world, um, founded Apple Computers. As he lay dying, uh, from, I believe it was from cancer, surrounded by friends and family, he looked up just before he died and said, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. And from the accounts of the people there, it appears that he was reacting to something otherworldly that he saw. Well, George Floyd, and as both a near-death experience researcher and nde -er and a legal analyst, I've watched the film, sadly, of him passing. George Floyd was extremely close to his mother who had passed. And before he died, he called out, Mama, I'm through. Now, look, I'm not trying to cause politics or anything here, but the video of George Floyd's death very well may be the most documented and recorded example of a deathbed vision in history. Share death experiences at the time of a person's death, bystanders or onlookers observe phenomena associated with the energy of a spirit leaving the body, not just relatives and close friends, but healthcare workers and other medical personnel. You can see a transparent replica of the dying person leave the body. Describe a feeling of your own body beginning to float, head towards the light. You may hear indescribably beautiful music, apparitions of the dead person's deceased loved ones, brilliant light filling the room at the time of death. And these are observations of Dr. Raymond Moody that were, um, he was quoted in the book, The Science of Near-Death Experiences. So, there is an overlap between deathbed visions and shared death experiences. And that's why I was saying earlier that NDEs, SDEs, deathbed visions, mediumship, visitations can't just be broken up into separate um, cubicles, that they all are interrelated because they're based on the electromagnetic soul's alignment with the higher vibration of the afterlife frequency. And that this this is the same graphic that I used for mediumship, and this applies for deathbed visions and shared death experiences. You have the dying person, the bystanders, the afterlife frequency, and the vibration of all three are overlapping, which is why people, the bystanders, who are not in any imminent danger or threat of dying, are able to perceive and to some extent experience what the dying person is as he or she is transitioning. So is there communication technology to communicate with the other side? Thomas Edison, in um, some of his last interviews, said that he believed he could develop what he called, the, uh, what became known as the spirit phone. He believed he could develop technology sensitive enough to communicate with spirits. My friend and colleague, Dr. Gary Schwartz, is currently developing technology known as the soul phone. Um, and um, I believe Mark, Mark Pitstick is also speaking at this conference, so he may be able to, to um, give you some recent updates on that. But what about in between Edison and Dr. Schwartz? What's the technology there? This brings me to, to um, the best friend I ever had. Uh, that's Billy. Um, we grew up together. I met Billy when I was 11 years old. Uh, we went to junior high, high school, college together. After uh, um, college, I went to law school and he went to Japan. And here we are in Japan at Kinkakuji, the Golden Temple. It's absolutely magnificent. The, the, the temple is literally plated in gold. He spoke Japanese uh, fluently and was teaching uh, executives in Tokyo um, conversational English. He also spoke Thai, Indonesian, and, and um, a good deal of Cantonese. And 
we had this ongoing debate from high school onwards. We'd both been raised in the Catholic faith, and, and, um, but he was an atheist. He said, Mark, I don't believe in, in, in God. And then when we were in Asia, and I was always talking to Buddhist monks and going into temples and having philosophical discussions with them, and he would say, I don't believe in an afterlife because science can't prove it. There's no technology to prove it. He said, but he said, I don't understand how you do the psychic thing. Um, you know, if you're lucky in life, you get one friend like Billy. Um, a couple years after this, he met um, Yuki, the love of his life. And when they came back to the States, they asked me to perform their wedding ceremony. I was a notary public. It was one of the greatest honors of my life is to marry my best friend to, to this incredible woman. And a few years after that, he died from suicide. I'm sorry, no matter how many times I tell the story, it, it just really gets me choked up. And I was absolutely devastated. I, I couldn't believe it. I remember when I got the call from, from his wife and she said, Mark, um, he's gone. Well, a year after that, I was speaking at a paranormal convention in Colorado in Estes Park at the Stanley Hotel. If you've never been, you need to go. Put it on your bucket list. It's right at the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. And um, I had given my presentation, and then there was um, the big, the, 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 the conference room. It was a huge room. And I had my table where I was signing books. It was my first book, Never Letting Go, had come out. And there was a lot of um, paranormal investigators there. And they were displaying and selling all types of, of paranormal investigation equipment, all of which scans different frequencies within the electromagnetic spectrum. K2 meters, tri-field, spirit box, digital voice, th uh, thermal infrared. Okay, so why am I bringing this up? So I'm, I'm at my table and I'm signing books. Now, my manager, Rocky, was with me. You know, she's, I, uh, she's uh, in attendance here. And any of you who've, who've uh, met me, uh, on tour have met Rocky and she she figured she'd go and check out some of the spirit communication technology and so she's walking by this one table she's probably about 50 60 feet away from from where I am here and she's walking by this table and a guy named Chris so he's a very well-known paranormal investigator she's walking by him and he has a spirit box in front of her and all of a sudden she hears get Mark and Rocky stops and the and Chris looks at her and goes, "Did you hear that?" And once again, it goes, "Get Mark." And he goes, "Do you think it means your Mark, Mark Anthony?" So I'm signing books and I'm hearing, "Mark, get over here, get over here!" And I'm like, "What?" And and I could see that this was something was going on. So I said, "Excuse me, everybody." And I got up and I ran over there, and and there was this like crowd starting to form and as i walked up to chris's table and i'm going before i could say anything i hear dude and i stopped and i looked at this the spirit box and i looked at rocky i go that sounds like and she goes and before i could say anything i hear love you bro it was billy's voice and rocky said my god mark that's billy because she knew him too and, and I, I couldn't believe it. You know, I'm a medium, you know, and, and I, I'm used to spirit communication and I'm used to the unexpected happening, but this was happening to me. And all of a sudden it dawned on me is he always told me there's no science, there's no technology. And I'm thinking that is so like him. He chose technology. He chose a, a scientific device to communicate to me. And, and, and the reason that I knew it was him, not only did it sound exactly like his voice, we grew up in the surf cult, surfing culture of East Coast Central Florida. He always called me dude. He called me bro. In fact, last time I saw him at Bangkok International Airport, I was leaving. He hugged me. He goes, love you, bro. And that's what came out of this machine. And this really got all the wheels and, and cogs in my head working. And it dawned on me that this spirit box scanner, that hearing, 
hearing Billy's voice come through this, this device, it led me on my quest to develop the term, the electromagnetic soul, and to find and discover how we are connected by the light from the cosmic to the subatomic. And that's why I know that the vibration of our world and the vibration of the afterlife frequency, they do overlap. Interdimensional communication is not only possible, it happens to all of us. It's only a matter of time until science perfects devices to communicate with it. Near-death experiences, shared death experiences, deathbed visions, after-death communication, mediumship, all of these operate on the same principles of frequency alignment between the material world and the afterlife frequency. And that experience, hearing Billy's voice and, and everything that I have studied in my entire life about the functions of the brain, quantum physics, faith, theology, science, and conducting over 15,000 mediumship readings led me to write my new book, The Afterlife Frequency. And my website is afterlifefrequency.com. Um, my book comes out on audiobook on October 5th in paperback, October 12th. You can pre-order it now at afterlifefrequency.com. Um, I, I also know that there's an after party, a Zoom room in, in conference room, one that Kathy Mason asked me to let everyone know because we probably don't have time for Q&A here. Um, but I certainly look forward to your questions there. And I want to thank Scott. I want to thank everyone for attending. I want to thank IANS for 40 years of, of, in, of enlightening the world and bringing these phenomenon out of the shadows of superstition and into the light. Thank all of you so much. God bless all of you. <laughs>